Check, 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 oh good, here we go. All right, you can hear me? Good. All right, so the teacher in me, all cell phones away and off. I know it's hard to believe that there was a time for you where, uh, you know, we're glued to our phones. And I'm glued to my phone, I understand. My students know I will be late for work. Not that I'm ever late for work, but if I left my phone home, I would turn around. I understand, I understand. But I also understand that when we um, unplug and we give whatever it is our undivided attention, we give it our best, right? So I'm Councilwoman Summers Johnson. And just to tell you quickly what a councilwoman is, because you hear that word and you're like, what is that, right? So we have a mayor and then we have seven council people. You, many of you might not be from Orange, so I'm gonna explain that there are seven council people. So there's North, South, East, and West, and then there's three at large, okay? One of the councilwomen is right here. She's gonna talk in a minute. This is Councilwoman Wooten. She's at large, meaning she's the whole city. I'm only the South Ward, which is down here. And basically, our job is to legislate and make laws that can be enforced to keep our community safe. So I'm literally just a kid from Orange. I came up through the school system. I'm raising my kids here now. And I was here for the opening ceremonies and I really enjoyed myself because there's different videos and things that you'll see. Um, and we thought, let's let the youth come early because the adults will be coming at three o'clock. But we really want to get your feedback it should be uncomfortable. It shouldn't be like sometimes in school, everything is A is A and one and one is two. It shouldn't be like that today. So depending on what you've been through and depending on how you look at the paintings, we want you to express yourself. Um, 19 people signed up and you see how many are here. What I'm saying to you is there's always gonna be opportunities. People always sign up for things. They don't come and we don't care. Because now that you're on my list, you're gonna be on Councilwoman's list. Every time we do a program, every time someone says, listen, I only have 10 tickets to go to a concert. I only have 10 tickets to go to Great Adventures and things like that. We get calls all the time and we never know who to give the stuff to. So now that you're on our list, you're on our list, okay? Another idea that we wanted to do was we wanted to get a whole bunch of rakes pick some senior homes and all of us go rake up the leaves, put them in bags, get community service hours, right? Because when we do that hands-on stuff for the community, it really makes you feel better. So you're getting two hours of community service today because we wanna hear from you. We want you to say, you know, I don't like that or that is kind of this or I really love this, this painting speaks to me. That means you're in an art show. Okay, so next up we'll have um, Councilwoman Wooten, who is at large. She's gonna come up and say hello. Look how amazed. She knows we had to speak at every, like what is, you thought nothing. There you go. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, everyone, my name is Adrian Wooten. I'm a Councilwoman at large in the city of Orange Township. This is my council BFF sister. Yes. We work a lot. Um, we have our kindred spirits, we think. Um, a lot, and I think it's because we were raised in the same sort of home. Um, she is like we are a married couple. We finish each other's sentences. We can be on a telephone call about something, and we can end up planning an event such as this. Um, today, I'm proud to be here today, and I was having a wonderful, wonderful conversation um, about the black experience in the United States of America and also the black experience in the city of Orange Township. Um, the art is poignant, it's, it's uh, phenomenal, it's going to make you think about certain things. Um, and, uh, we just answer speaking now, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And we will probably talk to you about some more, what, what would I say, what's the word for? More, not interesting, but more serious things as we go along and we walk. Um, the gallery and, and take part of the artwork. So thank everybody for coming out today. As Councilwoman Summers Johnson said, we get a lot of
tickets to go to shows and to go to certain places. And sometimes we're scrambling to get things or to get students. So now, as she said, we have your name on the list. I want to thank you for coming today, because um, we definitely, definitely will be calling you um, to help us, but to also like give things to you too. So thank you so much, and thank Councilwoman Wooten, Councilwoman Summers, for having this event. Um, it's not normal for a council person to want to talk to a, a lot of young people. Because you know, young people can say certain things that some council people are like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I'm no, a woman no. of a certain age, so <laughs> I have a granddaughter that's about your age, mm -hmm. so you're not going to say anything to shock me because, trust me, she has said it all. So, but, but thank you so much for coming. No, thank I, you. I always have to check and see when, when my students say stuff to me, I'm like, wait, is that a curse? Because one day I had on this real nice sweatsuit and they were like, purr. So I called my goddaughter, I was like, they said purr. I'm like, what does that mean? She was like, no, that was good. I was like, all right, now they could be cursing at me. I'm trying to make sure. So um, next up, I'm going to call Miss June. Miss June is the director of Valley Arts, and we are in Valley Arts right now. So director. Everybody. Hello. Oh, yeah. um, my name is June Smith. As uh, Councilwoman Summers just said, I am the executive director here at Valley Arts, which means that um, our work is never done. <laughs> but it's always great to see faces like yours in our spaces because obviously, oftentimes when we do have exhibits, um, we don't get to see uh, young, as many young people as we would like. Um, so this is just to me. Uh, emotional. It's emotional for so many reasons today, particularly. But this exhibit particularly has been a very moving exhibit for us because it's an exhibit that some people will find very disruptive. Some people have said it's very controversial. Some people have said it's very powerful. And so what I would like you to do today, as Councilwoman Summers and Wooten said, I want you to go around and I want you to, to share with us uh, what, you're, what you really see, what your social expression is, because that's the stuff that we're gonna take and we're gonna actually begin to have a real dialogue. The interesting thing about art, and I will say this, because I could go on and on and on, so in the interest of time, I want you to understand something very important. Art is something that is everywhere. It is in everything that you do. And when people talk about art, there is only a select group of folks who think that they belong to have a say in what art is. And what I want you all to understand is art is everything. It's in what we wear. It's in how we design. It's in how we play music. It's in what we, what we write, right? It is fluid. It is like water. It is like air. So I want you to understand that. I also want you to understand that you can create whatever you want to create. The beauty of having a gallery is so that people are able to show their work and have it revered and have it respected. But when you put your work out there, you need to un also understand that everybody's going to critique it. And some people are going to love it, and some people are not going to love it. Some people were very moved by this, and some people were very you know, uh, triggered by this. Okay? And so we need to understand this. The artist who created this, however, had a reason for creating this. And his reasoning for creating this is just as valid as that person who was triggered by it. Okay? The other thing I want you to understand is, is if you decide that you're going to be an artist, understand the business of art. It is not just about you creating something and having somebody buy it. It's about you understanding how to price it. It's about understanding how to position yourself so that you can be successful at it because the, the, the phenomenon that everybody says, oh, starving artist, doesn't have to be if you don't want to be a starving artist, okay? Because you will buy a piece, you will create a piece and it's, let's say it's, that's, you sell it for $200. Let's just say, that's not $200, but let's say it's $200. You come and you see it and you say to her, I'm going to, um, buy it for $200 and you're going to sell it to her for $500, mm -hmm. right? She says, oh, okay, she's going to sell it to her for 1000 This person here who created this, she thinks her art is only worth 200 It's already worth $1,000. Councilwoman Wooten buys it and she buys it for ten grand. Guess what? She's now an artist whose work starts at $10,000. But she doesn't know that because nobody tells her that. 
because now her work has been exploited by different people in different spaces. And so she continues to sell her stuff for $200, but she's now collected her stuff and now continues to sell it. And that is the difference in how people understand whether you're a starving artist or whether you're gonna be successful in what you do. So I want you to take in, I want you to learn, and I want you to ask questions. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you so much. I also have police and fire here, and I'm gonna have them talk after. Look, cause he, look. Okay, so let me explain something to you, right? So being a councilwoman in the city, um, one thing that is it, that we are most proud of is our relationship with fire and police. Um, you can't run a city without the city council, fire, police, having a very close uh, relationship and also public works. Why? Because when residents call you with concerns, you need to be able to pick up their personal cell phones because city hall is closed right now. So as much as we get on their nerves, we're like little sisters to them, big sisters to them, whatever. They'll do anything for us, and then our job is to make sure they are protected and have everything that they need. So before you walk around and look at all the art, I was contacted by um, a minister, Muhammad, who um, is from Newark, and he is going to come and speak to you about the peace agreement that's going on in the city of Newark. I thought it would be um, amazing for you to have an opportunity to hear from him. And after he speaks, you will then, um, I'll give you post-its, you will walk with a partner or someone, look at the art and just see, maybe rank them for the ones that are um, speak to you the most, okay? So we just want you, while we're here with you, to have an experience. When you leave here, this is not a normal community service hours type thing. You're gonna say, listen, I was in a room with government officials. I was in a room with fire, police. I was in a room with an executive art director, okay? I was in the room with a minister of a masjid mosque, right? I said it wrong. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, because I don't want to, I don't want to mess stuff up, right? But um, you don't always have that opportunity, right? So you'll be able to talk, and then after, I'm sure there'll be time for you to like corner someone and just ask them questions. A lot of times you don't get to do that because you're sitting like this. But this is how you're going to be sitting only for a few minutes because we're going to allow you to walk around. Okay, okay, Minister Muhammad. Thank you. Dear I just want to thank you for that being free for unto you. In the name of our Lord of Beneficent, the most merciful, once again, my name is Brother Abdul Haq Muhammad. I'm the student minister of the Honorable Minister Louis Farah Khan for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad in the Muhammad Mosque of Islam, number 25, which is located in the city of North New Jersey. Once again, I just want to greet you all with the greeting words of peace. We said in the Arabic language of I Salaam Alaikum, and that means peace be unto you. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the councilwoman and all the participants, and most importantly, I want to thank you. Um, my leader and teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, once asked us a question. He said, do we have problem children or do our children have a problem? He said, and if our children have a problem, they are not the cause, but they are the effect because children do what is natural until they learn what is normal. Okay. The African proverb says that it takes a village to raise a child. But then the subsequent proverb says that the child that is not embraced by the village will burn the village down in order to fill the village's warmth. Mm -hmm. So in North, we have what we have come up with called the North Peace Agreement. Now, what is peace? Peace, so teaches the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, is very simple. Peace means that I want for you what I want for myself. That's, that's what peace is. Peace means that I want for me or you what I want for myself. So if I don't want... To be harmed, then I shouldn't want to harm you. If I don't want to be belittled and berated, I should not want to belittle and berate you. And when we have that concept, then we have peace. But why should we have peace? According to the Children's Defense Fund for America, they say that a black child or teen is killed every six hours in America. Every six hours, a black child or teen is killed. In the city of North New Jersey, over a five-year period, over 122 young black men were killed. In New Jersey, they say that although black men only account for 8% of the state population, we account for 70% of the homicide victims. Just last year, they said that four black women were killed every day in America. Those numbers are dismal. 
So when the society don't have respect for their women, that's a degraded and a degenerate society. Because we are taught that a nation can rise no higher than this woman. We are taught that when there are not any decent women, there will never be any decent men, for the woman is the mother of civilization. And the hand that rocks the cradle rules the nation. So if you disrespect your woman, then that's a disrespected society and a disrespected civilization. And part of the reason that our community is in the condition it's in, because we have not had the proper respect for ourselves nor for our women. When we talk about violence, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has taught us from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that not having love for self, it is the root cause of hate, dislike, disunity, disagreement, quarreling, betrayal, snitching, fighting, and killing one another. He said, how can we be loved if we have not love for self in our own nation and dislike being a member of our own? But why don't we have love for ourselves? This is a very interesting picture. See, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has taught us for 300 years of slavery, we were lashed, beaten, and killed, given no education, read, and cared for by our slave masters. And being under that type of subjugation and oppression, we begin to suffer from what they call internalized oppression. Who knows what internalized oppression is? Um, it's when you're putting yourself down and also putting like the people around you down because of um, internalized racial trauma or Right. Very good. So internalized oppression is when you begin to do to each other what your oppressor did to you. See, internalized oppression is when you begin to do to each other what your oppressor has done to you. So what did our oppressor do to us? He killed us. He disrespected us. He did not educate us. And being under that type of subjugation and that tutelage, then we begin to do it to who? One another. Without him or her even happen to be there, we begin to adopt what? Their identity. Because they robbed us of our identity. So as a people, collectively, we suffer from an identity crisis, which is a state of confusion that happens when a person is unable to reconcile conflicting aspects of their personality. Mm -hmm. See, an identity crisis is a state of confusion, which happens when a person is unable to reconcile conflicting aspects of their personality. So what is your personality in conflict with? What God created you to be as opposed to what happened to you. So now you are in conflict and you are trying to bring resolution and resolve to what you are in conflict with internally. But I just wanted to give that backdrop, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, for our peace agreement in terms of what peace is and why don't we don't have peace. Naturally, we are people of peace, but we've been left outside of the circle of peace, not for one year, not for two years. Not for four years, but for 400 years. We were robbed of the knowledge of our God, the knowledge of our culture, the knowledge of our language. What language do you speak? English. Are you an English woman? What language do you speak? English. Are you an Englishman? So how you speak in English if you are not an Englishman? You speak the language of your oppressor. Your oppressor leave his mark on you by the language that you speak. You want to know who, who oppressed you? Look at your language. Mm -hmm. So you've got our brothers and sisters who are where? In Haiti. What language do they speak? Creole. What? Creole. Creole. Are they Frenchmen? No. They ain't Frenchmen, but they speak French. So that lets you know what? Who is their oppressor? The French. the French. And today, you notice that a lot of quote unquote black people and our quote unquote Haitian brothers and sisters, they don't get along, do they? They don't get along, do they? Is it that we don't get along? Is it because the French and the English never got along and we have adopted their beef? Man, you special. I just want to let you know that, that you special. That you very special. And don't believe what you see. Because you are not what happened to you. You are greater than this. You are greater than this. But if you don't know your history, then you have nothing to connect yourself to. You don't have a proper frame of reference. So you are left vulnerable to connect yourself to the circumstances. You understand what I'm saying? Because Carter G. Woodson said, if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world and it stands in danger of being exterminated. So your history is your guide. It's your frame of reference. But if you have no history, then what? You, what are you referencing? What you see in front of you, right? Because you don't have nothing to connect yourself to. So your history was taken from you. But that was done intentionally, not by happenstance. 
They did not want you to know that you were great, that you were a queen, that you were the mother of civilization. They did not want you to know that. But from all life came you. You, you are the origin of civilization. If there was no black women, there would be no brown people. There would be no red people. There would be no white people, with all due respect. <laughs> but you are the real Eve of civilization. Know that. Why are you telling me this? Because I never want you to think that you are what happened to you. Or you are what is happening to you. You are greater than all of this. And without you, there would be none of this. So as a woman, you are more valuable than silver and gold. You are more precious than any commodity or any material that you ever see. So never think that as a woman you have to lower your standards or degrade yourself to satisfy a man or anybody. Because without you, there would be no civilization. Think about how special you are that God allowed you to be the vessel by which he brings forth humanity. You are the, don't, not, you are the second self of the creator. You are the second self of God. You are God's laboratory. He uses you to bring forth humanity. We all love Jesus, don't we? But if there was no Mary, there would be no Jesus. We all love Moses, don't we? But if there was, he didn't have a mother, we would not have a Moses. So how can we honor the prophets and not honor the women that brought them forth? How can we honor Michael Jordan and not honor Michael Jordan's mother? How can we honor LeBron and not honor LeBron's mother? Without a LeBron's mother, there is no LeBron. I'm not trying to gas you up, but I'm just telling you a truth that you haven't heard or you haven't been connected to. You are special and you are important. You're not a thought. That's right. That, 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 no, you, you're not a thought. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, that's not who you are. Do you know the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that there's no such thing as a no good woman? He said, any way you find a no good woman, there's a no good man that made her that way. You know, y'all ain't here. <laughs> there's no such thing as a no good woman. He said, anywhere you find a no good woman, there's a no good man that made her that way. That men are at the root of the destruction of women. Did, did you know that? If you see a woman down, oftentimes a man is at the root of that. If you see a woman with low self-esteem, oftentimes a man is at the root of that. You are important and you are special. Yes, but men of this world don't desire righteous women. But you are righteous by nature. You are God by nature. I'm taught that the woman is older than the sun, moon, and stars. See, you just trying to gas us up. No, I'm not. That's what I've been taught. You all heard of Adam and Eve, right? And where was Eve conceived from? They say she came from the rib. Is that right? Well, my teacher says that if a woman came from a rib, then that would make you less than. You did not come from no rib, but you came from the God that created Adam. You are more than a rib. If you came from my rib, then why do I have one less rib than you? You are directly from God. You are directly descended from God. I know I'm getting a little carried away, but I'm just <laughs> excited to see all these women in here. Because this is a world that degenerates and degrades women. But you are greater than all of that. I want you to please hear what I'm saying. Leave here proudly and feel good and walk, with the, walk out here stomping. You, man, I tried to holler at you. You think you're too good for me? You should say, yes, I am. I am too good for you. I, I am too good for you. I want you to feel that and know that. That in order for a man to have you, he got to come right. Next time a, a brother come up with the game, don't let the, the cute face fool you. You need to ask him, why do you think women was created? And if he can't answer that properly, you leave him alone. But I'm, I'm talking about the piece of green. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm nice. sorry. But, but we have these, and, and we'll, we'll, hand, ask if you had we'll hand them out to you, OK? And, and we're here, we're your brothers. We are your brothers. So if you ever need us, call on us. All right? You have uncles. You got brothers. Even if you don't got brothers, you got brothers now. Right? So please, we love you. May God bless you. Thank you for listening. I should Thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to say this, right? So when I was approached for him to come and speak, I thought it was so appropriate because as a school teacher, 
I can count on one hand how many male teachers we have, and I can count on one finger how many black male teachers we have, or even teacher, male teachers of color, right? And I'm so glad that he was able to come and speak. I'm over here in, in Council of here, like, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Because this is being taped, it will be shown on our local um, channel, and it's important because even though there's not a lot of you here, this message is gonna go far because I think I heard him, I heard what he said, right? And this is why we can't be scared to let people come and speak, you know, because I think you all needed to hear that. I feel pumped, I'm over here like, <laughs> I'm over here saying stuff. I think we needed to hear it and I think he said it in such a profound way that if you did walk in here, you're at the age where everything affects you. What somebody, what you have on, if you might like it, but if somebody says, they don't like it, all of a sudden you don't want to wear it anymore. Mm -hmm. Having your own identity is really rough at this age, right? So um, I thank I thank you. I don't even know how I can thank you, but I thank you, thank you for, for that. Time. We thank needed you. it. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we have the artists here. You want the artists to speak, and then they're going to go look. Okay. So, so Ms. June is going to handle uh, that part. I am going to say I am excited. Yeah. I am. I'm, I'm feeling better. I was very emotional, but I know why now. I was emotional. I, and I'm so happy that you guys are hearing this because you now need to marinate, right? But the artists are here who did this stuff. I think uh, Jamal isn't here, but Mark McDonald, Gazer162, please come forward. The art on this side, Rob Perel created that. Phenomenal men, professional men. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let them say something. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> Check the time. Well, good afternoon, uh, young people. Um, glad that you guys were able to come out and see our, our, our artworks here at the uh, Valley Arts Gallery. Um, <clears throat> I'm Mark Gazer 162 McDonald. Um, I'm a graffiti writer and fashion designer. Um, I'm also a retired police officer. I was a police officer in the city of Inglewood for 26 years. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, I don't know if they still have the program, but I was uh, the officer assigned to the school district. So I was a liaison between what was going on in the community and what was going on in the school and vice versa. So I got an opportunity to work with a lot of the youth, and a lot of the youth got the opportunity to work with me. I was also a, a gang, uh, I was in the gang, gang task force. So I developed a, a rapport with a lot of the gang members and, and, and the youth in efforts to curtail a lot of the violence that had been taking place in, in the community when this gang thing surfaced in Bergen County, more or less. But, um, at the same time, I was also an artist, so you know a lot of my artwork is uh, reflects on personal experiences that I've had growing up in in the community of Inglewood, which is a very diverse community. You have the area where um, Swiss Beats and Lucy Keys live, and Ed Murphy in that area, and in the area I grew up in, the projects all in the same five mile radius of one another. So literally the town is set up and cut off in, in four quadrants. And so first ward, second ward, third ward, and fourth ward. I grew up in the fourth ward and it's lower income. But during the 80s, I was always interested in art and specifically graffiti during the hip hop, birth of hip hop era. That was what I attached myself to. So after that, I went on to, after I graduated from high school, I went on to Rutgers University, where I majored in, uh, where I have a degree in sociology with an interest in social work, and a minor in visual arts. So I was always in a, a, a capacity where I wanted to help people, specifically youth. I did a lot of volunteer work at the Police Athletic League in Brunswick, and um, um, I used to work at various camps during the summer, with the youth, and when I got the opportunity to become a police officer, I always knew the direction I wanted to, to, to go, and that was in efforts to be able to help the youth out. 
because the reason I actually became a police officer was because I had a bad experience with the police, well, several growing up, and it wasn't anything related to the graffiti thing, but it was just being a black man in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And uh, one specific event, which kind of changed my life direction, uh, was the NYPD, and um, I was accosted by an undercover officer, and um, he was wearing fatigues, and he had a long beard, and he accused me of jumping the turnstile. Mm. And back then, there was no metro card, there was no, you know, it was two tokens. You had, you had a token to go and a token to come back. So he accused me of jumping the turnstile. So the 80s New York City is a lot different, Times Square specifically, is a lot different from the Times Square that it is today. So at any given moment, you could have gotten robbed at any given moment. And at this particular time, um, I'm walking through the 8th Avenue Terminal going back to catch the A train to go back uptown. And this guy, as I described earlier, approaches me, tells me he's a police officer, get against the wall. Mm. I was like, nah, man, I know where I'm at. I'm not getting against the wall for anybody. So I keep walking and uh, continues telling me, get against the wall, you know. It's like, no. So at this particular point in my life, I was a, um, I was a practitioner of martial arts. I was on the uh, kickboxing team at my college. And I, you know, it wasn't like I knew that I was invincible. But at the same time, I wasn't going to give this individual an opportunity to get the best of me. So I started setting myself up. And uh, as I was, you know, going to do what I was going to do, he reached out. Mm -hmm. I reached back. And he had a radio. And he started calling for help. You know, like, you know, within seconds, um, the tunnel was, uh, was, was swarming with NYPD, transit police. So they got me against the wall. I'm five rows deep in a semicircle. And what was going on in the semicircle was um, the original camouflage officer and several uniformed personnel. They called me the N-word, N-word, why didn't you listen to us, blah, blah, blah. But the reason for that was they wanted to get a reaction out of me, they wanted me to wild out so they have a justification to hurt me. But I didn't give it to them. So I took my, my desk appearance summons as an arrest for jumping, allegedly jumping the turnstile. Uh, I'll get further into that later. So as we're going home now, it was me and three friends. We're going home and we end up walking across the bridge, and we parked our car in Fort Lee, and we get in the car, and we drive off, and uh, there's a, uh, a, a patrol car, has another car pulled over, and then we pass them, and sure enough, we get pulled over immediately after that. So I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? And I can't, I can't get a break. And uh, so, as, as the, the two officers approach the car, which is standard procedure, one on the, the uh, driver's side, one on the passenger side, I'm sitting in the passenger side. My friend, who's legally blind, sitting in the back, and my other friend who's driving. He asked my friend for his license, registration, and insurance, and my friend could only produce his license and registration. He went back and said, all right, when you find the insurance card, let me know. So he goes back. The other guy still on my side is, you know, you know just watching this. So I say, um, you know, I'm, I'm still hot about what happened in New York City. So I might not have the best attitude. But at the same time, I, I asked him, well, what was the purpose of you stopping us? And he, stick, he distinctly said he wanted to know what three niggers were doing driving around his town at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I was like, there we go. So now, after that, they got us face down on the concrete. And they're going through the car, you know, this and that. And the professionalism on the, of the police officer that was on the driver's side, can't say he was involved in it because he probably didn't even know what this guy had said. So um, after that particular incident and the thing in New York City and several other incidents that particular summer, I had a, a strong detest for the police. 
Um, I did not like the police at all. So that was uh, 92, I believe. 90, yeah, no, excuse me, 91. 94 comes along. I'm working in the film and video industry, and I have a friend that I grew up with, and he's a, a police officer in the city of Inglewood. So he tells me, hey, Matt, you should become a police officer. You should take the test. I said, ah, Tom, man, you know how I feel about the cops. You, you, you are right, and the guys I grew up with is good, but you know, your cohorts, I'm nah, not with that, not with that. He said, nah, man, you should do it, you should do it. So I was like, all right, you know, I just said, okay, just entertain him. Yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. So it was the last day. He said, hey, man, did you apply to, for the, to take the test? I said, nah, he said, go ahead, man, go down there. So I went, took the test. Long story short, I did very well on it. Passed the, uh, the, 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 uh, the written exam. Then it was the psychological exam. And then there was the physical exam. And all this time I'm thinking, I don't really want to do this, but you know. So then at the same time, I started thinking about um, the experiences that I, I had with the police. And I started, you know, questioning and doing some research on what the police did other than arrest people and harass people or whatever. And it kind of fell into uh, what I'd like to do as far as helping people. So I told them, um, they, 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 they gave me the interview, and uh, um, they asked me uh, what, was, what would be your idea of a, a police officer. So I explained to them, you know, somebody who helps the community, somebody who looks out for, for one another, you know, in, in efforts to make sure everything is right. So apparently he liked that answer, and I got to the next step. So the final step was um, I got hired. And uh, I had a, a, a decision to make that, that weekend, because Friday I got hired by uh, ABC Sports. I was, supposed to be, I was going to be working with uh, Monday Night Football. And I had a decision to make. Um, do I become a police officer, you know, and, or do I take the money for working at ABC Sports? And I said to myself, I, I had to wear a suit and tie either way. So I didn't have a car at the time, so the bus stop was, uh, was on the way to the police department. And it was a bus to New York City. So I start walking and I'm thinking, oh, God, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? So I just said, um, you know what, I could sit here and say how much I don't like the police, but that's not making a difference. So I decided to take the huge pay cut and become a police officer. And um, you know, I ended up working with the kids and that was what I really did. And that's you know, pretty much my luck. And I was able to still create art in the process. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Good. All right. Um, I want to start by saying, um, what are you guys? I want to talk to you. And I'll let you know a little bit about myself, but I got a lot to say about myself, so I don't even want to get into that. I've been through a lot. But um, what do you guys think about Black Lives Matter and the things that are going on right now? Anybody? Um, I think it's kind of important, like it's very important to talk about it, about those issues that are going on. Mm -hmm. I feel like we are very like, underrepresented in a lot of fields, and I feel like because of that, when we do get in those fields, we aren't treated properly, mm -hmm. because people don't know how to give the right amount of respect to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like we're also very underestimated as a community and as people. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like with Black Lives Matter, I feel like it's very important that people are reminded of that because I feel like when people talk about Black, My Black Lives Matter, the first thing they assume is like, oh, well, shouldn't it be all lives matter? And it's not saying necessarily that all lives don't matter, but it's prioritizing the lives that are being affected more than the people that aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's very important that we have that community, we have that organization, 
and we have that level of trust also in that organization to responsibly address our community as well. So, mm -hmm. good answer. Good answer. And one of the biggest things that you said was respect, right? If we're not respected, right? How do you gain respect? How do you gain respect? Yeah. You gain respect by giving it, but you also gain respect by like being kind to others. But also to yourself. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Let me explain something to you. I work with a lot of boxers, I work with a lot of artists, I work with a lot of everything. Without practicing on your craft, which should be love for one another, who's going to love you? Who's going to care? What strength do you have? If you kill each other, everybody else figures, so what? They kill each other? What do I care? Right? So the strength is here, building within yourselves. Like the other man said, women, you guys have the control of everything. Most of the guys do what they do to impress women, right? They go out, they want to be thugged out, they want to have a gun, they want to do this, they want to do that. All to impress the women, women and see how many women they can get. When you fall into the trap, you disrespect yourself, right? Because now you know this guy ain't worth nothing. He's doing whatever he's doing. And he got a baby here, and this one here, and that one here, and he's fighting on Instagram, and all that. Now it's a street fight, and everybody's recording, and that blows up into something else. All disrespecting yourself. That's what you're doing. So if you want change, you guys are the ones that got to change it. We're old now. We try. But you guys are the key to changing things. And the way to change it is to love yourself. That's it. And love each other. Stop fighting. Stop calling each other out of your name. Stop all the DMs and making things, blowing things up. And, and then the next guy, now somebody gets hurt and somebody wants to shoot somebody. These are the things that are wrecking your future. These are the things that are making you look like who cares about them? What are they going to do after we kill one of them? Riot? Break up their own community? Burn down things? Go crazy? So what? Everybody gets paid off you. They get their insurance money. The same police that you're saying you, you rioting against are getting overtime to watch your crowd run around and wreck up everything. So how are you winning? You're not. And the only people that can change it is you guys. No matter what I tell you about my life, that's in one ear and out the other, what are you going to do? When you leave here, what are you going to tell your little sister or your little brother? What are you going to do to change things? We can't do it. I can't go to your house and change, change your environment, right? You have to change it. Even simple things like cleaning up your own neighborhood, right? Garbage everywhere. People don't care, throw stuff in front of your house. If you clean up in front of your house, maybe people won't throw things in front of your house. I just did that. I clean up in front of my house, people start respecting my house. I put a garbage can in front, right in the gate. People dump the things in the garbage instead of throwing their Chinese food in front of my house. But you have to be the change. And the way to change things is in a positive way. See, if people see positive, and you make the negative, the irregular, you know, and you make them, the people that stand out and look stupid, then you take over with the positive. And now you can make a change, and now you can be comfortable. Nobody likes going to school and having to fight every day, and you might get jumped, or somebody might cut you with a razor. That's not fun. We try to make it like it's fun, because we want to be tough and, and put up this image that we're so tough, but that's aggravating. That's aggravating, man. That's, that's, you got a lot on your, on your mind and your shoulders. You can't concentrate on school. You can't concentrate on this because you're caught up in the nonsense. Ignore it. Somebody says something negative to you, ignore them. I've held myself back many times, and I had a very bad temper because of things that happened to me. But I, I've controlled myself for a long time. I've walked away from those people. I cut them out of my life, family members and all that. Cut them out of my life. Walk in a positive direction. Be positive. Change your community. 
That's the way things will change. Organize. Unity in numbers. You got to get together and be collective. You guys got to do it. We're trying, you know, and we've been trying. But you guys are the future. So you're the ones that have to do it. This little bit of people right here could change a lot of things in your community. Because now the next one gets on it. Now your, your, your younger brother or younger sister gets on it. And they raise up. And now they're in the positive light. And they're doing the right things. You just got to do it. Not us. It's in your hands. But I want you to know that. Look around. See things that we, this is a lot of stuff that we've been through. This is a lot of pain that we've been through. You don't want to have that pain for the next generation for your kids. You want your kids to be strong. You want your kids to have home ownership. That's another thing. We don't own anything. People have dropped the ball. A lot of people my age dropped the ball when it comes to home ownership and, and their parents own buildings and, 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 and houses and they mess up and they fail. You can't fail. You got to start owning your own communities. So these are the things that you have to do. All you guys have to do it. Right now, if you start reading real estate books and things like that, by the time you're 20, 21, you got a lot of knowledge. Now you can go out and buy what you want and, or set yourself up so that when you're 25, 27, you can own commercial properties and things like that and have more of a say-so in your community. But without that, you're just on the treadmill doing nothing. Blah, 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 talk, 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 doing nothing. Everybody can yell and talk and, and you know, defund police and all this stuff. Who you going to call with somebody right, right, right. running up in your house? Who you going to call? And guess what? The numbers, even though there are a lot of terrible police that are killing people, the numbers are way less than us killing us. Mm -hmm. I tell you that right now. I'm, Patterson, we had one police shoot killing and two police killings in maybe five or six years. What do we have black on black? Which is a catchphrase that I don't like also because everybody in their own community, Mexican kills Mexicans and everybody kills their own, you know, but just to make the point, the numbers are ridiculous. We got at least a good 30 something killings in Patterson and that's not counting the shootings. Back and forth, back and forth. Broad daylight, shooting each other over stupid stuff. Oh, you disrespected me on Instagram. Oh, y'all swerved through my block. What? <laughs> now you're doing 25 years and you kill somebody? What? He's gotta, gotta wisen up. And prison is not camp. That's another thing I'm tired of. Cats come out of prison and they act like it's camp. That's mental enslavement. You are mentally a slave if you like prison, where you're working for maybe 50 cents to a dollar an hour. Not even a dollar, right? It was like 50 cents an hour they get. But they're happy to get a job there, and then they get out and don't get a job because they took the hand. What the hell? What? <laughs> but you're going, I, I, I've, talk, I've talked to everybody. I've, I've talked to homeless people. I talk to hood people, I talk to anybody because they're all my people, right? What are you doing working for 50 cents an hour and then get out talking about I ain't working? What kind of, I, I know a dude that was, was, was spraying crops with pesticides with no protection and said when, they, when the sprayers broke, they had to take mop buckets and, and, and put the, put the uh, pesticides out. So you're endangering your, 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 your children, right? Because all of that stuff is going up inside you now when you procreate. What are you making after you had all of that in? But you'll do that for a dollar an hour. When he got out, he quit two jobs and start selling drugs again. And went right back to jail. Got to wise up. And the only way to do it is you guys spreading that knowledge and changing yourself. That's all I have to say. I want you to look at the art and just put whatever category you want, your top three screens to you.
failure. So you're saying the the flag is connected to America and what was done. Okay, you good? It's, I know, look, we make it look easy speaking in front of people, but it's not. It's not. We understand that, but we just do it so much. All right. Did you pick yours? What's your number one? This one right here that headlines are you free? Oh, okay. And why? Because it's like it. it it really made me sit there and think, like, are we really free? Because, like, they were saying, like, <clears throat> like, I don't know. It's like, it's hard to say it. So you think, so the question is something that you never mm-hmm. thought about, really, until you looked at it, and, and then, it sparked the question back and, in your head. And underneath it, it says, like, we're mentally enslaved, and I know, like, one of the artists, they were, tell- they were talking about, like, us still being mentally enslaved. Mm-hmm. It just really made me sit there and think. That's good. That's what art is supposed to do. Yes, ma'am. What is your number one? Well, my number one was that one back there in the line. The first line says, if a kid does not care if he lives or dies himself, it resonates me because I noticed that black people have this like this long mentality. Mm-hmm. Like they can do everything on their own and stuff. And I noticed that as a community, we're not together. And I noticed that Mexican and Hispanic mm-hmm. might be, like, I don't know if it's, but they be like doing stuff. They have houses together and all that stuff. Yes. And we just don't, like, we don't care about one another. Right. So that's, like, an issue. And we don't, like, I don't know how to describe it, but we care more about others than we care about ourselves. Right. You know? Right. Or, right. And, and, and honestly, that is profound. You know, you, you try to figure out how people come to this country with, like, nothing, and then they pool their money together, and they're able to open up stores, and, like, you were saying, um, buying multiple houses. Like, that's something that I'm starting to see happen a lot with people I grew up with. They're like owning multiple um, streams of income and, and properties and things like that. So that's something that you might not think about doing some things now, preparing for tests that once you turn 18, because you have to be 18 to be a realtor, right? Or how old? 21? 21. 21. So who says you can't read about these things now so that when you get old enough, you'll be able to do it? So I'm just going to bring fire and police up real quick. I'm going to bring fire at these. So while they're coming up, what we really wanted from you is that first, you be able to attend the art show. Second, you be able to hear from the artist. And third, that you'll be able to look at the art and choose so you can say, you can tell someone, not only did I go to an art show, but I was actually able to be in the room with the people that created it. That's not something that always happens, so we're happy that you were able to do that. Like I said in the beginning, having fire and police here is because This city cannot run correctly. If I could not pick up the phone and call the police, sometimes things happen, uh, a traffic light might be out, and I'm trying to prevent it. Sometimes a resident calls us, they're upset about something, or they say, I haven't seen my neighbor in a week, we need to do a wellness check. We send the police there. It's not always, they're not always going to arrest someone. They actually go and check on neighbors and make sure everything is good. Um, They also team up together and they have like an academy for youth that I hope this year you'll be able to have where the students do like two weeks for fire, two weeks for police. I'm a firefighter's wife um, and um, I think it's a very important job to have, but I'm just saying I'm glad that you guys will be able to go through a training and see what they do. And they don't take it easy on you either. They give you the actual, you know, little snippet of the training. So I have fire go first, because police loves to talk so much. It's like, it's, it's rock on never wants to talk. <laughs> okay, so we have our um, fire chief. All right, um, my name is Gerard Long. I'm the fire chief, City of Orange Township Fire Department. Um, I'm actually from this area of the city. I grew up here. Uh, I just want to thank the council for having the privilege to have been together, as well as June and the, uh, and the artists as well. Uh, this is something that, um, when I was your age, I didn't have 
this kind of experience. Uh, when Brother Hawk came up, and he was, he was with, with the things that he was saying, and as I, and as as Councilman, you asked, a lot of people didn't get these conversations mm -hmm. or things said to them. So that's why I believe that these kind of events should happen more in the city. So even though I'm a fire chief, uh, I kind of take things in the city a little bit more personal with these kind of events because I grew up here and I know how I, how I was uh, when I was in I'm also a black man in America, so I can relate to everything that's going on around here. So I just want to thank you for also being here and showing up mm -hmm. because, it, because, it, because it means something. So um, once again, thank you. And I'm glad you're here. And, uh, and I, I'd, like to, I'd like to be invited again to the next event. Definitely. Um, so thank you. OK. Now, Rocco, <laughs> our police officer, one thing I want to say, he's usually on a motorcycle. Um, and he always, my son, he's, sometimes he's in front of my son's school when they, um, they need to do crossing. Um, but we get to see each other a lot. And, you know, just can you just tell us maybe why you became a police officer? Why you chose to do it? So my name is Officer DeSantis. I've been with the Orange Police Department for 16 years now. I uh, am assigned to the traffic division. But um, as you see, I'm here speaking to you lovely folks. Uh, <laughs> I'm a man of many traits. Uh, I ride the motorcycle. Um, I'm a firearms instructor. I teach at the academy. Um, I go to schools in our town and read to younger kids. Um, I'm really involved with the community. Um, why did I become a police officer? So I was born and raised in Orange. Um, and I worked at a local restaurant on Main Street when I was a little man, little boy. And, um, I knew I had something more to give than just cooking, and which is one of my uh, absolute thing that I love is cooking. And I like art on the wall, cooking to me is art. I love doing any type of dish, uh, no matter what it is. Um, so I felt that I needed to help people in other aspects, not just by serving food or taking their orders. But um, as soon as I came out to the job, I delivered a child because of my, uh, I can speak Spanish, uh, I can speak Italian, obviously I speak American, <laughs> but um, so a young lady was giving birth and no one knew how to speak Spanish, so they called me. So I actually helped this young woman give birth. And um, other than that, it's it just so other things that we touch upon. Um, we get called out to people when a family member has lost their lives. Uh, I've helped family members in desperate times. Uh, so it's not just all pulling people over. Mm -hmm. It's helping people, helping the community. And basically, uh, I enjoy talking to people. Excuse me, my voice a little bit. <laughs> I'm working a, a trip today, so. Oh, sure. A little, little time, a little time. Well, I, I, oh, like I said, I always want to have fire and police here because I think if you only see police arresting people, then that's you're going to think that's all they do, right? And if you only see firefighters putting out fires, you think that's all they do. And these jobs, careers, are for women and men. We have women in both, and I think we're up to two um, female um, firefighters. If I may count one of our female firefighters, she just, she's a captain now. She's the first female captain mm -hmm. in the fire department history department. So I just wanted to say that. Yes, because, yes. Uh, we have some young women here if they decide that they want to take another route into public service you know, as possible. So you have one more assignment before we finish. On one of your posters, I just want you to, as your exit ticket, I just want you to write about your experience so that myself and Ms. June and Councilman, so that we can see, you know, how we can make things better or, you know, what was your experience so that we can hear it. That way you don't have to talk. We'll just give you some time just to write about it. Make sure you put your name, your grade, and your school at the top. Okay. 